This is an audiovisual podcast on replacing the Resource Management Act. What do we replace the Resource Management Act with? And how does efficiency be gained through a single uh, one-stop shop legislation, especially for our cities? Remember, again, transport begets land use. Land use begets transport and both beget the use environment of the city. A bit about me. I am a spatial planner and urban geographer based here in southern Auckland. I have been engaged or advocated for large projects such as airport to Botany Rapid Transit, down to smaller placemaking projects such as individual bus lanes, street calming and parklets. My continue, uh, current goal is, is to continue pushing for, as policy, the 15-minute city, as seen in Paris, or the 20-minute 20 city, 20 city seen in Hamilton. The context around replacing the Resource Management Act, it's been talked about for years, about reforming the RMA, as it's known in short form. But it's never been talked about what we're going to replace it with until very recently. Thus, the context is, is that the leader of the opposition, uh, National Party leader Judith Collins, has announced that if she is able to form the next government after the September ele elections, they would repeal the Resource Management Act, so the RMA, and replace it by two new ones. So it's just not a straight out replace and, uh, sorry, repeal and dump. We've actually now got a replacement in hand. Two new laws. The Environment Standards Act, which I interpret will deal handle the national environment standards that are currently available in the RMA. And then you've got this big one, which is uh, drawing up a lot of interest. An Urban Planning and Development Act. So an urban planning and development act these laws would go to the house so the parliament at the end of 2021 so at the end of nationals first year if they were to be elected into office defeating labor currently in new zealand our planning is in a complete and utter muddle this is because our planning instruments are muddled across different legislations which all act in silos. And as so, soon as you have silos, there's no crossover. And this would become evident with the unitary plan in Auckland, so our main land use planning document as required under the RMA. The unitary plan couldn't touch things that were done in the building code, so six, star, six green star buildings, and it couldn't touch urban design because it's not codified anywhere in legislation. So in the New Zealand case, we have the Local Government Act 2002 with the four general well-beings, and it also requires councils to do long-term plans. These are 10-year budget plans of which the first three years must be funded, and then it is updated every three years. To put an extra one in, we have the Local Government Act Auckland Amendments 2009, which governs uh, and gives legitimacy to Auckland Council and Auckland Transport. However, this legislation requires a spatial plan, but it is not statutory weighted, unlike our regional and the district plan, or in Auckland's case, the unitary plan. Which we come to next, the Resource Management Act itself. This is where your regional and district plans kick in, although in Auckland's case, because we're a unitary authority, we don't have a regional and the, and the independent city councils anymore. We are a unitary authority, so the two come together. The regional and district plans, and you get what's called the unitary plan. But it's still our main land use document. You have the Land Tr Transport Management Act. So this is where our transport plans come from that we need to do every three years. And then, you, of course, you've got the Building Act 2004, okay, the building code. And then nowhere across the legislations is urban design codified. That is, we have the Urban Design Protocol 2005, but that could be shunted to one side. Urban design is not a statutory requirement. 
And then, of course, our finance financing options are muddled across just about every piece of legislation you can name under the sun. So here it is all muddled, and this is what makes it very inefficient to the point of confusing. And if it's just confusing for Auckland, then try every other region and district and city council throughout New Zealand. There's over 74 of them. Introducing what I have written or mentioned in passing over the last three years, introducing what is called an Urban Environment and Building Act. Note it is not an Urban Planning and Development Act, although they could be similar in concept. National will have to flesh this out. It is a Urban Environment and Building Act. So the Resource Management Act would continue to stand, but it would only apply to rural environments. For cities, so Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin, and maybe some of our larger centres like Palmerston North, Queenstown, and the likes, Whangarei is another example, they would come under this. And the name gives it away itself. We're looking at legislation that governs our urban environment. So the city, or the town, and also building, the physical building. So we're rolling in the building code. And it works in a hierarchical structure. So the first thing that would sit at the top that dictates everything else underneath it is a spatial plan. The legislation would require you to produce a spatial plan. Now, some say that can already be done. Yes, the Resource Management Act can allow it, but it's not statutory waiting. The Local Government Act 2009 Auckland Amendments also requires us to do a spatial plan, but it's not statutory waiting. It can be simply ignored. So what's the point? So under this Urban Environment and Building Act, all councils would be required to do a spatial plan, and it would be statutory weighted, meaning all other plans underneath it, unitary plan, long-term plans, the building code, urban design and infrastructure financing, which comes to the side, would be required to give effect to the spatial plan. The spatial plan becomes the master document which dictates all outs. Coming down, you have infrastructure financing, which comes into the side. It comes into the side of the hierarchical stream. It is semi-independent, but it gives the councils and technically even the government, if it was to engage in any of this, and it can be, which we will see at the end through urban development authorities, it gives the funding tools required, if need be, to the public authorities to realise the spatial plan and to enact the other the rest of the plans below it then we come down and then you've got the three you've got the unitary plan which is just the auckland name for your district and regional plans so your land use planning you've got then the long-term plan which government would also be required to do which is your budget document and this long-term plan must give effect through funding the, the requirements of the unitary plan and the spatial plan and this is where infrastructure financing comes in because most of your capital expenditure is funded through debt and repaid for over the life of the asset. Then you've got the building code. Remember, Urban Environment and Building Act. So we've brought the Building Act into the legislation. And thus, when, the planning, when planning is done, the building code must give effect to these plans well, these plans also guide the building code. Then underneath, you've got a sub-branch. We're codifying urban design for the first time. Codified. It will have a statutory weighting. And the urban design must... is actually the implementation plan of the building code. So as you can see, it comes down as well. But it also goes back up. So north-facing sites, for example, especially with residential. The urban design also recognises that where, as projects, as the unitary plan is executed, as your land use document, land use planning is executed or implemented, your urban design kicks in. So if you're going to do a development, it must have, which is recognised in the unitary plan, and then it must follow urban design protocol.
which is codified and also must follow the building code. And again, the urban design must give effect to the spatial plan that is in place. So again, the spatial plan sits at the top. This is a very simplified version of how the act would work. But simplicity and standardization is the key. The more simple and more standardized your legislation and your plans are, the easier they are to comply with, the better effect they will have in action, and the less likely for loopholes to occur or to be sought out and exploited as you would expect and get in more complex legislation such as the RMA. Spatial planning. Because I've mentioned that this new legislation would require a spatial plan, what is spatial planning? Spatial planning is the systems that are referred to, the methods and approaches used by the public and private sector to influence the distribution and the activities in spaces of various scale. Spatial planning can be defined as the coordination of practices and policies affecting the spatial organization. Basically, spatial planning looks at the spatial form or the urban geography of a city. Spatial planning or the word spatial was also used the way that planning should just deal more than simply with zoning and land use planning. The unitary plan or your land use plans or the design of the physical form of cities and regions, urban design, but it should also address the more complex issues of the spatial relationships, the human behaviours, the city behaviours caught triggered by the activities such as employment, homes, and leisure uses. So you're looking at the urban environment. Hence, Urban Environment and Building Act. We are bringing in the physical form. We are bringing in the behavioral form. You're bringing in the physical geography. You're bringing in the human geography. And as a spatial planner like myself, we engage in spatial planning that influence, that either dictates or influences how the public and private sector uses their influence to the distribution of people and activities at various scales. Now, various scales can be national, state level, so if you've got a federal system, interregional, regional, sub-regional, community, site-specific. So a spatial planner like myself can be engaged at all of those levels, from the top to national, down to regional, to interregional, inter to regional, to sub-regional, right down to site-specific. So for construction firms, a spatial planner can be uh, useful, especially if you're trying to influence policy or spatial form through your work because something either works well or it is not and it needs to be supported or changed. So that is spatial planning. So when you're doing a spatial plan like the Auckland plan, which is in its current 2050 iteration or the second iteration, it is there to influence the spatial form and, the, and its relationships between employment, home, and leisure across the Auckland region. Hence why it would sit at the top of all the other planning sitting underneath it. That's why it becomes statutory weighted in this new legislation. So now we'll go down each of the steps. Spatial planning. The Urban Environment and Building Act would require all councils or council to develop a 30-year spatial plan that is reviewed every 10 years. This would be a statutory document that dictates the, all other plans underneath it. So at the moment, Auckland is required to do one, a 30-year one, and it update, it's just recently done an update. But they usually should be updated about every 10 years alongside a unitary plan or a land use plan. 
But the difference between the current Auckland plan and this version proposed and this new proposed legislation is that it is a statutory document. All other plans underneath it must give weight to this plan. And at a minimum, the spatial plan would be required to have the following in it. Population forecasts, dwelling and job forecasting, the framework of the spatial form, so how you would like your urban environment to be over the next 30 years, so how your preferred spatial form, because this will dictate your zoning while respecting the environment and climate change legisl legislation. Outline the behaviours you're trying to influence the spatial form and, of course, the consequence. If you're going to have your spatial form dictating industry must go here, here and here and it's totally disconnected from your transport network or your population centre, there's going to be consequences to that and it's even going to impact your climate change as well. It's going to fall foul of climate change legislation. And then benefits and costs, monetary, social, cultural, economic and environmental. Because whatever the spatial form takes, it's going to have benefits and it's going to have costs. Infrastructure finances. So we're coming on the side. Government has access to unlimited currency, modern monetary theory, at the lowest interest rate through the 90-day bills and the 10-year bonds. Conventional infrastructure financing is done through raising debt and repaying it over the life of the asset. Quick fire. Housing and road and civic infrastructure is 50 years. Rail and things like water pipes are 100 years. So it is repaying over the optimal life of that asset. Government would inter establish, if it has not already done so, a centralised state infrastructure bank to allow the councils, NZTA, so it's the Transport, New Zealand Transport Agency, Kiwi Rail, to access a centralised pool of currency to fund the projects needed to support the urban and rural environments at the lowest inter interest rates. So rather than uh, Auckland Council having to raise its own bonds, NZTA having to do the same, Kiwi Rail having to do the same, they all can come to a one-stop bank to do it where the government can access New Zealand currency at the lowest rate. Of course, the infrastructure financing would help inform the drafting of the long-term plans because it would have fiscal prudence measures added to it, especially when respecting climate change legislation so that the financing could not be used for projects that have benefit cost ratios of less than 1.1 or projects that would cause overt harm to the environment beyond mitigation, remedy and avoiding techniques. The unitary plan or land use planning. These are the master use documents and they must follow the wishes of the spatial plan. Currently, the, our unitary plan in Auckland does not need to follow the Auckland spatial plan per se. But with the spatial plan in this urban environment and building act codified, the unitary plan must follow it. But at the same time, there are also features. Because this is now central legislation, central government legislation, so it's national wide, this would apply up and down the country. So now you have these features. Standardised zoning and definitions. Standardised objectives. Standardised urban design outputs. Standardised infrastructure hierarchy and definitions. And this is across all infrastructure. Physical, transport, including transit, civic, and social. Standardised framework for private and public plan changes that are compliant with the spatial plan. Note the word standardised is used five times. So no matter if you are in Auckland, you are in Hamilton, you are in Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin, 
you open up their land use planning, their unitary plans, the zoning and its definitions, its objectives, its design outputs, its high infrastructure hierarchy and definitions, and what the requirements are for a private or public ch plan change will be the same, exactly the same. Just applied individually to the local geography of the area. Standardization promotes efficiency, efficiency promotes compliance, compliance promotes less looking for loopholes or feeling confusion. Value for money. The unitary plan would also partner with the building code section of the combined legislation. It would also be standardized plain English. Now we come to the building code because the building code's been brought in. The building code, updated of course, to reflect modern building techniques, including the six green star rating, although I've dropped it to five in this case, universal access, and modular homes built off site and assembled like IKEA flat packs on site, would be recognized in this new merged a code that is with the legisl combined legislation. Again, Urban Environment and Building Act. This allows the effect of pairing rather than siloing. Remember how I said the Auckland Unitary Plan couldn't touch building methods? That's because the Building Act is not part of the RMA. The Unitary Plan is an RMA document currently. So you've got a siloing effect. Whereas if you bring it under one legislation, they partner. And the code would also pair with Auckland, oh, sorry, urban design outcomes with five star green ratings at absolute minimum in all builds. Also, north facing sites for residential. Universal access becomes compulsory. Currently, in Auckland, you only need to do it if the development is above 14 dwellings in size. It becomes compulsory across all builds. Now, for a three story walk up, the universal access would only apply to the ground floor. It wouldn't need to apply for levels two and three. But because our code requires elevators from level four up four stories or above, universal access kicks in again. And it must recognize best practice on climate change, passive ventilation, insulation, and fire safety. I should see no more of this aluminium cladding stuff floating around. It must recognize international best practice. Long-term plans and the annual plans which sit under it. Long-term plans or LTPs will be required, continue to be required under the Urban Environment and Building Act. This is where you've got pairing up with the Local Government Act. But the LTPs must give effect to the spatial plan. They are the main funding instrument and in execution or implementation plan to realize the spatial plan. This includes mapping out the infrastructure builds over that 10-year period. Thus, it removes the need or the duplication found in regional land transport plans and regional public transport plans. They're gone, or rather they're merged into the LTPs, and they're updated every three years accordingly. Again, the LTP would be updated every three years with spatial and unitary plans every 10. Councils, of course, would have access to the State Infrastructure Bank. So to access to currency at the lowest interest rates possible. A language would again be standardized. And here's one. Central government would also be required to produce long-term plans as well, updated every three years. So it would be done year one of a three-year cycle. So it's basically, it would be done the first May budget after an election. So central government would also be required to do it as well. This allows for stability and pipelines to be established. So again, councils, construction, planners, and even your citizen has a standardized pipeline and has predictability. There's nothing worse than unpredictability when you're trying to build and maintain a city. Urban design. For the first time, urban design would be codified meaning it has statutory weighting. While it is deemed a subset of the unitary plans, 
the spatial plan would have a major influence on the urban design outcomes as well. It would also, as I mentioned earlier, partner with the building code. Language, again, would be standardised, no matter if you're in Auckland or any other city in this country. The language is standardised. It would follow international best practice. So I should not be seeing main streets with cars, car parking on them. Not when international best practice in urban design dictates streets that are free of cars, that are transit malls or pedestrian malls, encourage increase in patronage spend by 40%. And it would also be Indigenous-led. In fact, the entire act should be Indigenous-led. And I should have probably put it on top of the spatial plan. This would be Indigenous-led. Not co-design, not top-down Eurocentric, Indigenous-led. They know the lay of the land. They would be best to lead the urban design principles. And finally, some miscellaneous material. If the government wishes to influence spatial planning through the government policy statements, which basically guides how transport is to be done, then either the GPS follows the spatial plans that the councils have written, so government for once, government is following councils, or government writes its own central nationwide sp spatial plan for the regions then to follow. The government and the councils can work that out. Urban development authorities would be allowed to continue and would be governed under this legislation. So urban development authorities for medium and public, sorry, for medium and large public-led urban development or renewal projects would be allowed to continue or be started up. Our Monaco is an example. So the, this, the UDAs are given effect in this legislation, but... They must comply with all aspects of spatial planning, land use planning, long-term plans, and urban design. They must comply with all those plans in place. They cannot do things independently as Kayanga Aura can currently do in Auckland. Rural environments would either be handled in thus a reformatted and reconstituted RMA or through new legislation. Why have I separated the rural environments out? They are a different base. Cities operate very differently to how a rural environment works. Remember, you've got agglomeration in effect. You've got people to get, a lot of people close together, and the behavioural patterns and the spatial forms that come about as cities are different than the rural environment. So the rural environment would be handled differently. This is why it's an urban environment and building act. It just recognises cities are very unique organisms and that it recognises the Resource Management Act as a physical geography document since 1991 has just not been able to handle the urban environment or the human geographies of the city. So that is why it is done. In summary, our legislation is currently muddled across many pieces of law, from the Local Government Acts, there's two of them for Auckland, to the Land Management Transport Act, to the RMA itself, to wherever the financing tools sit, or even some parts are not even recognised at all, urban design for an example. The Urban Environment and Building Act brings together these planning instruments, because they are all planning instruments, including financing, because if you don't have financing, you're not funding anything for your city to be built, or repaired, or maintained. And it acts as a one-stop shop in a hierarchical fashion on how it must be done. So your spatial plans sit at the top, with infrastructure financing coming in on the side, and you have your unitary plan or land use planning, your long-term plans, your building code and urban design, all which must give effect to the spatial plan. The spatial plan not only recognising the zones and the land use and the transport, 
but also the human and urban behaviors that are either caused by that spatial form or influence that spatial form. This has been an audio-visual podcast on replacing the Resource Management Act with the Urban Environment and Building Act. This audio-visual podcast was done by Ben Ross, a spatial planner. If you'd like to comment, engage in dialogue, and so on, you can reach me at ben at colab.nz. Further podcasts on urban geography matters can be found at voakl.net.